Section 39, Part 1 of Chapter 11 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone. Book One, Chapter Twenty Two, Part Two. Chapter the Eleventh of the Clergy. The people, whether aliens, denizens, or natural born subjects, are divisible into two kinds the clergy and the laity. The clergy, comprehending all persons in holy orders and in ecclesiastical offices, will be the subject of the following chapter. This venerable body of men being separate and set apart from the rest of the people, in order to attend the more closely to the service of Almighty God, have thereupon large privileges allowed them by our municipal laws, and had formerly much greater, which were abridged at the time of the Reformation, on account of the ill use which the popish clergy had endeavoured to make of them. For the laws, having exempted them from almost every personal duty, they attempted a total exemption from every secular tie. But it is observed by Sir Edward Coke that, as the overflowing of waters doth many times make the river to lose its proper channel, so in times past ecclesiastical persons, seeking to extend their liberties beyond their true bounds, either lost or enjoyed not those which of right belong to them. The personal exemptions do indeed for the most part continue. A clergyman cannot be compelled to serve on a jury, nor to appear at court leet or view a frank pledge, which almost every other person is obliged to do. But if a layman is summoned on a jury, and before the trial takes orders, he shall, notwithstanding, appear and be sworn. Neither can he be chosen to any temporal office as bailiff, reeve, constable, or the like, in regard of his own continual attendance on the sacred function. During his attendance on divine service, he is privileged from arrests in civil suits. In cases also of felony, a clerk in orders shall have the benefit of his clergy, without being branded in the hand, and may likewise have it more than once, in both which particulars he is distinguished from a layman. But as they have their privilege, so also they have their disabilities, on account of their spiritual avocations. Clergymen, we have seen, are incapable of sitting in the House of Commons, and by statute, 22nd Henry the Eighth, thirteen are not allowed to take any lands or tenements to farm, upon pain of ten pounds per month, and total avoidance of the lease, nor shall engage in any manner of trade, nor sell any merchandise, under forfeiture of the treble value, which prohibition is consonant to the canon law. In the frame and constitution of ecclesiastical polity, there are diverse ranks and degrees, which I shall consider in their respective order, merely as they are taken notice of by the secular laws of England, without intermeddling with the canons and constitutions by which they have bound themselves. And under each division I shall consider, 1. The method of their appointment, 2. Their rights and duties, and 3. The manner wherein their character or office may cease. 1. An archbishop or bishop is elected by the chapter of his cathedral church, by virtue of a license from the crown. Election was, in very early times, the usual mode of elevation to the episcopal chair throughout all Christendom, and this was promiscuously performed by the laity as well as by the clergy, till at length, it becoming tumultuous, the emperors and other sovereigns of the respective kingdoms of Europe took the election in some degree into their own hands, by reserving to themselves the right of confirming these elections, and of granting investiture of the temporalities, 
which now began almost universally to be annexed to this spiritual dignity, without which confirmation and investiture the elected bishop could neither be consecrated nor receive any secular prophets. This right was acknowledged in the Emperor Charlemagne, Anno Domini, 773, by Pope Hadrian I, and by the Council of Lateran, and universally exercised by other Christian princes. But the policy of the court of Rome, at the same time, began by degrees to exclude the laity from any share in these elections, and to confine them wholly to the clergy, which at length was completely effected, the mere form of election appearing to the people to be a thing of little consequence, while the crown was in possession of an absolute negative, which was almost equivalent to a direct right of nomination. Hence the right of appointing to bishoprics is said to have been in the crown of England, as well as other kingdoms in Europe, even in the Saxon times, because the rights of confirmation and investiture were in effect, though not in form, a right of complete donation. But when by length of time the custom of making elections by the clergy was fully established, the popes began to accept to the usual method of granting these investitures, which was per annum et baculum, by the prince's delivering to the prelate a ring and a pastoral staff or crozier, pretending that this was an encroachment on the church's authority, and an attempt by these symbols to confer a spiritual jurisdiction. And Pope Gregory the Seventh, towards the close of the eleventh century, published a bull of excommunication against all princes who should dare to confer investitures, and all prelates who should venture to receive them. This was a bold step towards effecting the plan then adopted by the Roman See of rendering the clergy entirely independent of the civil authority, and long and eager were the contests occasioned by this dispute. But at length, when the Emperor Henry V agreed to remove all suspicion of encroachment on the spiritual character by conferring investitures for the future per sceptrum and not per annulum et baculum, and when the kings of England and France consented also to alter the form in their kingdoms and receive only homage from the bishops for their temporalities instead of investing them by the ring and crozier, the court of Rome found it prudent to suspend for a while its other pretensions. This concession was obtained from King Henry I in England by means of that obstinate and arrogant prelate Archbishop Anselm. But King John, about a century afterwards, in order to obtain the protection of the Pope against his discontented barons, was prevailed upon to give up by charter to all the monasteries and cathedrals in the kingdom the free right of electing the prelates, whether abbots or bishops, reserving only to the crown the custody of the temporalities during the vacancy, the form of granting a license to elect, which is the original of our Hange de Lisier, on the refusal whereof the electors might proceed without it, and the right of approbation afterwards, which was not to be denied without a reasonable and lawful cause. This grant was expressly recognized and confirmed in King John's Magna Carta, and was again established by Statute 25 Edward III, Statute 6, Chapter 3. But by Statute 25, Henry VIII, in Chapter 20, the antient right of nomination was in effect restored to the crown, it being enacted that, at every future avoidance of a bishopric, the king may send the dean and chapter his usual license to proceed to election, which is always to be accompanied with a letter missive from the king containing the name of the person whom he would have them elect. And if the dean and chapter delay their election above twelve days, the nomination shall devolve to the king, who may by letters patent appoint such person as he pleases. This election or nomination, if it be of a bishop, must be signified by the king's letters patent to the archbishop of the province, if it be of an archbishop, to the other archbishop and two bishops, or to four bishops, requiring them to confirm, invest, and consecrate the person so elected, which they are bound to perform immediately without any application to the see of Rome. After which the bishop-elect shall sue to the king for his temporalities, 
shall make oath to the king and none other, and shall take restitution of his secular possessions out of the king's hands only. And if such dean and chapter do not elect in the manner by this act appointed, or if such archbishop or bishop do refuse to confirm, invest, and consecrate such bishop elect, they shall incur all the penalties of a premunire. An archbishop is the chief of the clergy in a whole province, and has the inspection of the bishops of that province as well as of the inferior clergy, and may deprive them on notorious cause. The archbishop has also his own diocese, wherein he exercises episcopal jurisdiction, as in his province he exercises archiepiscopal. As archbishop he, upon receipt of the king's writ, calls the bishops and clergy of his province to meet in convocation, but without the king's writ he cannot assemble them. To him all appeals are made from inferior jurisdictions within his province, and as an appeal lies from the bishops in person to him in person, so it also lies from the consistory courts of each diocese to his archiepiscopal court. During the vacancy of any see in his province, he is guardian of the spiritualities thereof, as the king is of the temporalities, and he executes all ecclesiastical jurisdiction therein. If an archiepiscopal see be vacant, the dean and chapter are the spiritual guardians ever since the office of prior of Canterbury was abolished at the Reformation. The archbishop is entitled to present any lapse to all the ecclesiastical livings in the disposal of his diocesan bishops, if not filled within six months. And the archbishop has a customary prerogative when a bishop is consecrated by him to name a clerk or chaplain of his own to be provided for by such suffragan bishop. In lieu of which, it is now usual for the bishop to make over by deed to the archbishop his executors and assigns, the next presentation of such dignity or benefice in the bishop's disposal within that see, as the archbishop himself shall choose, which is therefore called his option, which options are only binding on the bishop himself who grants them, and not his successors. The prerogative itself seems to be derived from the legantine power formerly annexed by the popes to the Metropolitan of Canterbury. And we may add that the papal claim itself, like most others of that encroaching see, was probably set up in imitation of the imperial prerogative called primae or primariae praesis, whereby the emperor exercises, and hath immemorially exercised, a right of naming the first prebend that becomes vacant after his accession in every church of the empire. At right, that was also exercised by the crown of England in the reign of Edward I, and which probably gave rise to the royal corridies which were mentioned in a former chapter. It is also the privilege by custom of the Archbishop of Canterbury to crown the kings and queens of this kingdom. And he hath also by the statute 25, Henry VIII, chapter 21, the power of granting dispensations, in any case not contrary to the Holy Scriptures and the law of God, where the Pope used formerly to grant them, which is the foundation of his granting special licenses to marry at any place or time, to hold two livings, and the like. And on this also is founded the right he exercises of conferring degrees in prejudice of the two universities. The power and authority of a bishop, besides the administration of certain holy ordinances peculiar to that sacred order, consists principally in inspecting the manners of the people and clergy, and punishing them, in order to reformation, by ecclesiastical censures. To this purpose he has several courts under him, and may visit, at pleasure, every part of his diocese. His chancellor is appointed to hold his courts for him, and to assist him in matters of ecclesiastical law, who, as well as all other ecclesiastical officers, if lay or married, must be a doctor of the civil law, so created in some university. It is also the business of a bishop to institute and to direct induction to all ecclesiastical livings in his diocese. Archbishoprics and bishoprics may become void by death, deprivation, 
or any very gross and notorious crime, and also by resignation. All resignations must be made to some superior. Therefore a bishop must resign to his metropolitan, but the archbishop can resign to none but the king himself. 2. A dean and chapter are the counsel of the bishop, to assist him with their advice in affairs of religion, and also in the temporal concerns of his see. When the rest of the clergy were settled in the several parishes of each diocese, as hath formerly been mentioned, these were reserved for the celebration of divine service in the bishop's own cathedral, and the chief of them who presided over the rest obtained the name of decanus, or dean, being probably at first appointed to superintend ten canons, or prebendaries. All antient deans are elected by the chapter, by Conge de Lisier, from the king, and letters missive of recommendation, in the same manner as bishops. But in those chapters that were founded by Henry the Eighth out of the spoils of the dissolved monasteries, the deanery is donative, and the installation merely by the king's letters patent. The chapter, consisting of canons or prebendaries, are sometimes appointed by the king, sometimes by the bishop, and sometimes elected by each other. The dean and chapter are, as was before observed, the nominal electors of a bishop. The bishop is their ordinary and immediate superior, and has, generally speaking, the power of visiting them and correcting their excesses and enormities. They had also a check on the bishop at common law, for till the statute 32, Henry the Eighth, chapter 28, his grant or lease would not have bound his successors unless confirmed by the dean and chapter. Deaneries and prebends may become void, like a bishopric, by death, by deprivation, or by resignation to either the king or the bishop. Also I may here mention once for all that if a dean, prebendary, or other spiritual person be made a bishop, all the preferments he was before possessed of are void and the king may present them in right of his prerogative royal. But they are not void by the election, but only by the consecration. 3. An archdeacon hath an ecclesiastical jurisdiction immediately subordinate to the bishop throughout the whole of his diocese, or in some particular part of it. He is usually appointed by the bishop himself, and hath a kind of episcopal authority, originally derived from the bishop, but now independent and distinct from his. He therefore visits the clergy, and has his separate court for punishment of offenders by spiritual censures, and for hearing all other causes of ecclesiastical cognizance. 4. The rural deans are very antient officers of the church, but almost grown out of use, though their deaneries still subsist as an ecclesiastical division of the diocese or archdeanery. They seem to have been deputies of the bishop, planted all round his diocese, the better to inspect the conduct of the parochial clergy, and therefore armed with an inferior degree of judicial and coercive authority. End of section 39. End of part 1 of chapter 11 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 1. Recording by Father Ziley, Detroit, Michigan.